And it, it's a disgrace to the Hebrews. They, they're, they're just ruined. They're not how they should be. They're all jacked up. And, 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 and it, here's what it took. The very first thing. Man, this is why I love people that can speak into my life, man. Because it took a coach for them to work as a team. It was always ruined. They were ruined for a long time. Not all, it, it was ruined for a long time. So when, when these, the same people who lived in these walls with the holes in them, they just let it be ruined every day. Right? They lived, the same people who worked to rebuild it in record time lived there in its ruins and they were okay with it. They got comfortable with it. They, 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 got, they didn't see anything. It's just what it is. It is what it is. It's just, it's, it's falling apart. This is where we live. There's not much we can do about it. So we whine about it. We complain. We do what we have to do. And then that's it. Right? It's the same people. But it took somebody. It took somebody to, saw the, to see the same exact need. But rise up to the occasion and begin to be anguished and pray over the condition of those city walls and of those gates, man. He began to weep and he began to pray and he began to fast, man. This terrible news that, 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 that they saw other nations were mocking Jerusalem. He was so burdened by that. I, I want you to hear me right now, man. Listen. I want y'all to get this, man. I, I, I can't stand another day of the world mocking the church or people that represent Christianity because they simply choose to get comfortable in the sin lifestyle and the spirit of God not moving even though they say they're a Christian man and other people mock it. I've been at meetings where they mock faith-based approaches in Christianity. They literally laughed at me in my face because I say, I'm not a clinician. I go from the word of God is where I get my truth and people's lives are transformed. Then they say, bring us a success story. And I say, I can fill this room 10 times with success stories. Right. You haven't told me one yet in your approach in 40 years of doing what you're doing. Amen. They asked them, give Come me a on. success story. They said, it's pretty hard when I don't have one. Hmm. So I got thousands of them. Not only in my life, but in many lives. I can fill this room with them, man. And, and there were so many people that, that were mocking this, this city of Jerusalem that was surrounding it. That he was anguished over it. I'm burdened over people getting looking at Christ and, and giving them a name or taking it as just something that's like go with the flow or menial. God is God. Man, he's something to be feared. I don't mean scared. I mean reverence, respected. His name, right? His name, what he's done, the fact that he gave his son for us. This isn't something to play with. And Nehemiah understood that. But the, this terrible news burdened him and he knew, here's the difference, he knew something had to be done. So we didn't call pastor and say, hey, listen, I got this great idea. I've seen homeless people out on the road, and we need to do this, 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 and, and what are you going to do about it? I'm going to pray. I'm going to continue to do everything I can to follow God as I'm burdened to follow God. And if God laid that on your heart and you saw the need, man, maybe he's calling you to do something right. about that. There's youth ministries. There's, there's, there's leaders that will go walk these streets and pull people from the streets and give them the gospel because they see a need. They just refuse to rise up to the occasion. They're waiting for somebody else to do it. And all the while we're waiting for somebody else to do it, people are mocking what we say, man, is the very thing that changed our life because so many are walking in timidity. Right. They don't walk in the authority that God gives. They don't come like Nehemiah and bust up and he went and he viewed it by himself. He snuck away from everybody and he viewed the city and he viewed the different gates and he viewed the destruction and how bad it was. And he, I think he went by himself for this reason. I think it's real similar, man, to the reason that Joshua, when he marched around the walls, God said, don't speak. Because doubt could have crept in. I think someone might have tapped someone else on the shoulder and been like, this is insane. <laughs> what are we doing? We're about to get murdered in just a minute. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think doubt would have crept in. And so God said, just be quiet. That's why Nehemiah, I believe, went by himself because he knew everyone else was going to discourage the work because they all lived there and nobody was doing a thing about it. <clears throat> so, man, he knew something had to be done. 
And he knew he had to take on the project of rebuilding what God once made to be beautiful that had been broken down. He knew he had to take on the burden to rebuild that. He knew he had to. And so, man, he did what he had to do, man. And, 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 and for years, now listen to me, for years these walls have been nothing but rubble. Years. Imagine demolishing this building with a big backhoe and tearing it all down and then just let it sit in a pile of garbage for years. And come here and tell me how much of a mess and how much of a, how unsafe it would be to be anywhere near this, this building. So these walls are in ruins. It's rubble for year after year after year. And the people are just tiptoeing around it and living right there in it. But nobody doing anything. And this man heard about it, man. And he said, we got to do something. But go to Nehemiah 1 real quick. And I want you to see, and I want you to see Nehemiah's response. It says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakali, it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Han and I, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Right now, here's the key to the beginning of change. I want everyone to hear me when I say this. If you want change in your life, if you want change in your city, if you want change in a loved one, if you want change, this is where it starts. It doesn't start with a motivational speech and I get up on the chair and I shout real loud and I bring my javelin that Matt got me and I hold it up in the air and, I, and we all yell and I hold up like Indians, right? That's, that's what we do. That doesn't last. Pep rallies are for a short moment in time. Then you have to get another one and another one and another one. But this is where genuine change begins. Right here. And Nehemiah understood it. He just got the news. Devastating to him. Did he get mad? Did he talk trash? Did he say it ain't my problem? Right? He's away from there. He's in the castle. He's got it made. He ain't living in ruins. He's living in, in splendor. But he still was so burdened by it, man. It says, so it was. When I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days, right? He doesn't just say, he had a moment where he's like, oh man, bad deal, bro. That's, that's horrible. And then just went back about his day. It says he mourned, he wept, right? If we're not mourning and weeping and, and, and for many days over the condition of your lost loved ones or over the condition of this lost and dying world or over the condition of yourself that has some ruins that have been in there because of life and because of decisions, man. If you're not anguished over your condition, change never happens. You hearing me? That takes humility. Pride says, I'm good. I'm straight. I'm definitely better than him. I'm definitely better than that one. I'm doing pretty good. But humility says, I am so anguished over the condition of my mouth or my mind or my family or my city or, or, or these drug addicts that are struggling. Instead of people saying, I wish they would just all go drown themselves in the river and it would take care of the problem. I wish you would have the opposite where everybody is running to the river before they jump in there and grabbing them and pulling them out of there, man. The difference is somebody decided to do something about it and many, many, many just live in it. I'm not going to live in it. Nope. Amen. I'm not. Yeah. I'm going to continue to get better. It might be one pebble at a time. It might be one little stone at a time, right, that I put in that piece, but it's going up. It's different. It's more weight. It's more substance. It's rebuilding something that, that God made to be beautiful, and it's seeing it done, man, and it's seeing it happen, but it starts with being anguished over your condition. I've seen many people come and go from here. I've seen many people come and go over the years at Teen Challenge. I've seen many people come and go when I was a drug addict, man. I've seen many The difference in change is they got anguished over where they were in their life or they didn't. Right. If you're not anguished over your condition and there's some pride left over in there, you will continue to do what you do and continue to stumble and struggle and fumble around, man. Learn from a fool. I've done it. I've 
I've done it, man. So let me let me tell you that, that this is the beginning of change. So he sat in one for many days. It says, I was fasting and I was praying before the God of heaven. Right? I was down before him. So when he heard that the walls laid in ruin and, and its gates were charred and rotting, that the, that the survivors were living in distress and reproach, but they were okay with it, man. I think that burdened them just as much, man. And, and he decided to do something about it. What every, what every Christian, what every great leader has to do, listen to me, what they have to do when, when problems come, fast and pray. Lord, forgive me for not doing that more. Yeah. We have to fast and we have to pray. That's the first thing that he did to bring change to a situation, man. That's the something powerful happens when you fast and when you pray, man. Something happens when you stand in the gap for your people. They were standing in the gap. They were in the gap, the literal gaps, the holes that were in the wall. They were standing in it so no enemies could come in. And they were rebuilding. They had, they had their hand on their sword and they keep watching. Why? Because I'm anguished. They've been through so much and I'm going to fight for them. I'm not just going to be there and fight for them. I'm going to help them rebuild. I'm going to use my hands. I'm going to use my mind, Amen. my energy. I'm not going to be okay with this staying in ruins. The same people that lived in the ruins that didn't do anything about it, all of a sudden because of one man decided to say, boom, all right, I'm going to rebuild this. And all of a sudden action started to come. But what? how'd they get money? Here's where real smart people I'm not smart, I don't have this problem. Here's where real smart people struggle, man. <laughs> they try to figure it all out. You ain't ever going to figure God out. Mm -hmm. So a real smart person would say, okay, now I see the vision. I have something to do. But hold on. Those gates are 30 feet high, 22 feet wide. Big, huge wooden beams, cedar beams or whatever they were using to build those beautiful gates and those big stones. That's, we're talking some money. That's going to cost a lot of money to rebuild that, right, man? That, that could be a 10-year project. That, that could be a huge project. But as Nehemiah went and he said what he needed, everything that he needed, God already had it in place, already had favor for him, already had all these things. So as he went, literally, he, he got permission to go to the forest and get the trees for the wood. He got permission for this. He got permission for this. He had favor. Everywhere that he went because his attitude was one where he didn't have to do anything about it. But he was so, everybody saw his burden for it and his passion for it that they're like, okay, we're going to, and they started to jump on board. And God was putting everybody that they needed right there in the path, man, right there. What is, why, why did he fast and he pray? You can talk about it, but until you pray about it, you don't internalize it. That burden doesn't come in your heart and get in there, man, and start to take root and, and, and start to start to just birth something in you where you have to do something about it. And you know you're the one that's called because you have the burden and you have the, the anguish over it. You want to change your life? Get anguished over it. Being truthful. You want, you, 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 you want to change? You want to change, man? No more regretful statements. You want to change the fact that, man, I feel like I might have wasted this many years of my life or, or I might have walked away from the Lord and it caused some ruin in these places. You'll never get back to the restoration where God will make you a new creation until you get anguished over it. Y'all with me? Until yes. you get anguished over it, man. I want to share with you five things really quick. Based on the story of Nehemiah, man. And, 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 and I want to talk to you, man, about um, just these five things that God spoke to my heart. But Nehemiah, man, he had this call. He had this vision. Now he's starting to put people in strategic positions, man. Exactly where they need to be. If you read through Nehemiah, you'll read every... He says, this person and this family, I put here. This person and this person next to that person. They strategically names where he put them, how he put them. It was organized. He started to do something, man. Then he started to be, be intentional. And they all labored. You hear me? They all labored. All of them. Until the work was completed. Mm -hmm. Amen. You hear me? Yeah. We, we, we pray five cent prayers and want million dollar answers. Ooh. How's that work? 
Nehemiah didn't pray no five cent prayer. God help me. He fasted. He prayed. He mourned. Right. He deprived his Amen. body of what he needed. His belly was brown and he was starving. But he lay there and he mourned. And he said, God, this is so much worse than the way that I feel. Man, this you, you made it, God. Your name's being mocked. Your people being mocked. I can't stand for it, God. And he did something about it, man. A lot of times, man, y'all pray your, your, your five-cent prayers and you're, at, you're wondering why things aren't happening. Been there too. I'm not telling y'all anything, man. I ain't dealt with myself or been convicted about before, man, for sure. Right? But that's what we do a lot of times. God, I just, mm. God's saying, man, where's, where's your anguish? Where's your anguish, man? Zerubbabel had led the way before to restore Jerusalem's temple, and Ezra led the way to restore Jerusalem's worship. And then you look at Nehemiah, man, and, and, and a new leader was needed to restore Jerusalem's walls. Hear that, man. So God just had the men in place to bring this to completion, man. It needed, the temple needed restored, the, the worship needed restored, the walls needed restored. And God had those people in play. The contemporary of this one did the other one, man. God laid it on their heart. What's your, what do you see the need? Where do you see the need? Why is this a girl center? Because I saw a need. Right. It was supposed to be a guy center. Why did I change it? Down at the police station one night at 2 in the morning, this little girl, man, that lost her kids and her family and was putting herself in dangerous positions and never even did drugs before. And there was nowhere for her to go until 7 or 8 when the, when the hospital opened up. And I couldn't take her to my house. And long story short, she went and she had three hours to, to hang out outside the police station and just wait for the hospital to open. She said, I'm going to walk down the road. I'll be right back. It was like 10 and a half months later, she was still missing Police had pictures of her out there, man, and all kinds of stuff. And God spoke to my heart and said, there's a need for moms, for women to be able to be rescued in the moment of crisis and right. take them right where they need to go. And I said, okay, God. And we did something about it. People started to get on board. A vision started to be accomplished, man. Things started to be built, right? Things started to get donated. People's money started to show up where there was no money donated. We started to get things that we shouldn't have even had, man. People started to call out of nowhere. Government officials started to call. Senators started to call. Congressmen called. We had people start to come. All this stuff started to happen. And all we did was say, God, we see the need. We're going to rise up and do something about it. Amen. I'm anguished over people Amen. that are drug addicted. I'm anguished over people. People that don't know Jesus, man. It breaks my heart to know that people are going to die and go to hell. Yeah. Anguished over it. We might be called to the same thing. We might be working on walls together. You might be working in, in restoring worship together. I don't know, but you got to pray and say, God, what burden do you have on my heart? What need do I see? What stands out to me, God? I need to make a change. I need to do something about it. I need to get anguished over it. And again, there's no great, great, great miracles in this book other than them having a mind to work, following a man of God that had a calling on his life, and it was rebuilt in record time. It was restored back to the beautiful place and original way that God had meant it to be. It was restored. I truly believe, you can call me crazy, I truly believe that where I live and where I have my family is going to continue to just be restored. Amen. It's going to continue to be restored. It's going to be more beautiful. How do I know that? Look at my life. Look at your life. Yeah. If there's ever a time where I can look at somebody and say, there's ruins, there's rubble. It's not, it's not good there. I can go look in the mirror and remember my past. Not good. Nothing good about it. Rubble. But God took something like this. And when I got anguished over my condition, he began to put people in my life that helped me rebuild. That stood in the gap for me. That prayed with me. That taught me truth. That held me accountable. That continued to do the daily work every single day. And this body was rebuilt in record time. Where even the world said... Your life is not, my judge. When I went for sentencing, he said, I never see this. It was his exact words to me. He was sentencing me, I never see this. That's what he said. And I was like, oh, man, I'm thinking about that's my record. I'm thinking about that's my charges. And he read my charge. That's all he said. He read my charges one by one. Three different cases against me at that time. Read every charge on every case. And I was like, Whoa. I'm done. You know what I mean? And my attorney did this. Your Honor, this is why I tell you my class has been doing to better himself, but I don't understand it. 
And he walked over and sat down. And I'm like, I'm like, hold on, I, I'm just getting over anger issues. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm going to peek this dude in this courtroom right now in front of God and everybody, man. And I remember just being like, and the only thing I did was say, God. And I was anguished over all the people I seen in the hall. I was anguished that I was back in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I went and got dope and sold dope for years and years and years. And I'm back in that same environment around those same people. And, 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 and I hated it. I was anguished that the same people were still doing it and in trouble. And, and, and I just got over a year program. I'm on fire for the Lord and I'm serving Jesus. I was anguished. My mind wasn't on anything angry at that point. It was anguished. It was broken. And I remember I, the judge said, you have anything to say for yourself? And I shared about Jesus in that courtroom. Because that's the only thing I knew to do. Amen. And I shared about Jesus. It changed my life, man. And he went back through and read every charge and said, suspended, 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 suspended. He said, I'm not throwing them out. Because I don't know if you're being real or not. I don't see this. He said, we're going to find out. He kept one charge on each case, threw out all the felonies, and basically a year and a half later, I called him and said, I just got promoted to a director's position, man, down here. He said, I'm dropping everything. How do I get people where you're at? Wow. And he was a retiring judge. And I got to share that with him right before he retired and thank him for giving me the opportunity. But I had to get anguished. I had the opportunity to change like that 7,000 times in my life. Growing up in church around Christian people, I went to the altar 500 times probably, man, like... I was always crying in church because I always felt convicted. I always felt bad. I always felt less than. Right? I'd give my heart to Jesus every single time because I just thought maybe it didn't take or something. And I'd cry and do it, man. I just wasn't anguished. I just wasn't broken. I wasn't in a place where I said, God, you have to be everything. Nehemiah earned the king's credibility. This isn't the first thing I want you to know. Right? Nehemiah earned the king's credibility as a child of God. It's so important to have credibility with people and authority and, and your parents and teachers and supervisors and pastors and each other, man. Why? Because that means that you're living it out in a right way. Right. That means you're a man or a woman of your word. That means, that, that means when you say this is going to happen, that it happens, man. We should have credibility as, as children of God with people, influential people. Nehemiah had, had credibility because he was faithful and because he was consistent in who he was. Yeah. Why do we lose credibility? Because we get inconsistent. Titus 2 says that we show a pattern in all our good works so it'll shut the mouths of, the, so it'll shut the mouths of, of anyone who has anything evil to say about us. Right, man? That, I, that doesn't mean that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this over and over and over so they just shut their mouth. Gonna, that means that you're going to be living your life in a way where, where what you say is what you do is who you are and you have credibility. Right, amen, amen. As children of God, we need that. There's been a lot of fake that's been on TV about preachers and church. And there's a lot of fake that we see. There's a lot of garbage that gets out there. And, and we lose credibility. Right? When I say I'm a Christian and, and love is what binds me. Love is what saved. Love is the reason that I reached out. Love is what kept Jesus on the cross. It's all about love. God is love. But I speak ill against my brother, and I speak hate, and I speak tearing down, and I speak discouragement, man. How can I say that I love? I lose my credibility in my, in my saying, I'm a Christian. Mm. Nehemiah earned the credibility. Therefore, when he saw the need, rose up to the occasion, everything was there that he needed. Yeah. Hear this. People have to believe in you before they believe in anything that you are part of, a ministry of anything else. They have to. You have to have credit. Nobody believed in family care until they got to know me. Then they started believing in what we do because they have to believe in the people and the staff and, and the leaders before they believe in your cause. He had credibility, man. I should be able to walk into the courtroom and have credibility. I should be able to walk into the police station and have credibility. If I'm, if I'm the hands and feet of Jesus and I'm loving and I'm helping and I'm building up, man, people should want my presence in the room. They should want yours. Yeah. They should want it. Yeah. He had credibility and he earned it. Listen, again, this story isn't just, and it happened. I love those stories because I like when it happens like that. 
This story is all about a longevity of being the man that he was. Year after year after year after year after situation after situation. Nehemiah lived his life a certain way in a way that he earned credibility. He didn't know he was going to have this call. He didn't know he was going to go rebuild these city walls. But he was living it anyway. When the call came, when he saw the need and the call came, it was so easy to fall into place because everyone was like, yep, 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 yep. You got it. The ones who didn't matter, Sanballat, and some of the other That's ones right. who were coming against him, they were opposing him. They were trying to distract him from the work. They were trying to get him off track. They didn't matter. He didn't have that credit. They didn't have any influence on his life. They were trying to get him to stop the work that God was calling him to do. So he just shunned him. And he was able to say, you know what? No, because I have credibility with all these people. I have favor, and the work is getting done. He lived it before the calling came. Hear me. Some of y'all, man, there's callings on your life, but you ain't seeing nothing happen because you ain't living it. You ain't willing to live it in longevity year after year. God will, God will give you a, a, a ministry. God will give you many things more than you can even ask, think, or imagine. But you have to earn that credibility, man. That's what this story is about, man. The second thing I want y'all to know, Nehemiah fasted and prayed to God and asked for God's mercy prior to taking action. You hear me? Nehemiah fasted and prayed to God, asked God for mercy prior to doing anything. He didn't take any action. He didn't make a phone call. He didn't sit down and cast vision. He did nothing but fast and pray first. You want change to happen? Fast and pray. There's a church, I shared this in a sermon not too long ago, and, 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 I'll, and I'll close. There's a church overseas, they got like 10,000 people, and I think, I think I see it's 100,000 people. I know, I know it's the largest church, um, I think, in the world. It was, it was huge. That would have to be 100,000 people. Yeah. But anyway, they said um, the biggest need is counseling. People are needy. You know, pastor said, I pastor 30 people, and they're so needy, and they, they don't like the carpet or the sound. They don't like this. Like, like, like people can get needy sometimes, man. And they said, how do you counsel with that many people and have a staff like the size of ours? You know what I mean? How do you do it? And he said, I barely counsel ever. So they had 100,000 people. I barely ever counsel. How? Because every time someone comes with a problem, we send them up to this prayer mountain and they have to fast and pray. And they fast and pray for 24 hours. And if they come back, then we say, go back for 40, 72 hours. Then they come back and they said, okay, go fast and pray for a week. And they come back and if they don't have the answer by then, we say, go we'll fast and pray for, for 10 days. And before you know it, they always come back and they always have an answer eventually. I don't have to counsel. I just say, go pray. And people get to the place where before they do anything, they have to be anguished to get on their knees and fast and pray, man. Nehemiah did that first. In order to rebuild, we have to have preparation in the presence of God. Hear me. Before you rebuild anything, your life, your personal life, before you rebuild your relationship with your children, before you build a relationship with somebody, before you do anything that way, man, before you build anything, you have to have preparation in the presence of God. Y'all with me? Yes. Third thing, really quick. Nehemiah's testimony was not only rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, that's powerful. But here's, I've heard this preached on hundreds of times, man. Here's something that I've never heard anybody preach on in this story. And I don't know why I overlooked it so many times, man, until, until last night, man. Nehemiah's testimony wasn't just rebuilding the walls. It was also rebuilding the lives of people. You hear that, man? It wasn't just the walls and the gates that were getting rebuilt. This is a beautiful story of a nation of people that were in exile and, and living in rubble, and they were okay with it, restored. Right? These people got restored. In your work, in your living for Christ, you not only see your life change, rebuild. The things around you where you live, your home, your city begin to rebuild. But you begin to see the people that dwell there rebuilt. Without that, what's the point? So the testimony that I've heard so many times were the walls. But I want you to get in the lives of people was just as great, if not greater, of a testimony, man. The fourth thing that I really want y'all to hear as well, because I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on this today with the belief that every one of y'all are going to put this into action. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking it as it's done, it's settled, you're doing it, you're living it, you're seeing the call, you're rising up and we're working together. I'm taking it like that. I'm believing that, man. 
So here's why I wrote this one down the way that I did it. And, and, and the fourth thing is he didn't claim glory for himself, but he always gave God the credit for his success. Right. You know how much credit I get for what I do? How much do you think, John? None. Probably one percent. Not enough. Probably one percent. Alicia, I watch her and what she does. You know how much credit she gets for what she does? Most people don't even know what she did or what she does. Right, man, because she just did it. She did it at home. She did it when she just could have been sleeping. She did it. She just made it happen. It's not about getting or saying, look, look what I did. Nehemiah never once said, I led, I led this charge. Y'all see what I did over here? Y'all see this? Mm -hmm. He never once said that. Right. He gave God the credit. Amen. Right. I did this and my life was changing. Thank God. Hallelujah. My God, you're building a city. Josh, you're so, you're so, you're so. No, thank you, God. The best advice I ever got was you let a compliment roll off your back the same way you do an insult. That's right. right? You appreciate it? Someone come up and say, I have a problem with you. I don't like you. Okay. I don't know you, but I guess I don't like you either. It's not a real good input. It's not a real good meaning. You know what I'm saying? I love you, but maybe I don't, maybe I don't like you. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, man, you think about it, man. And, 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 and when you look at what Nehemiah did and, and the crazy, what he gave up, leaving the... Leave, Everything yeah, that he did. Man, today's day and age, we want credit and boast about that. We want everybody to know it. We post it on Facebook. We take pictures of like our own house and, and this rubble wall right here. Like, <laughs> do the work. Just do the work. <laughs> and God got the credit for it. I can't, I literally can't take credit for one person that I've ever spoke life into because I never spoke my words right. or, and, and they worked. Amen. My words have never worked. Everybody I've ever talked to has forgotten already my words. The only thing that's ever stuck with somebody has been when I communicated the word of God through my mouth to them. Even if I didn't say it, it says in Matthew this, it was communicating truth of scripture that, that, that they remember. Everything else gets forgotten eventually. So it's God that's getting the credit for it anyway, man. Amen. This is all God. Amen. And the last thing, really quick, when Nehemiah faced opposition from his enemies, listen, you're going to face opposition in many different forms. You just are. It might be an authority figure. It might be a court system. It might be. Uh, it might be in, in a. It might be just Satan in your mind. It, it might. You're gonna face. Opposition, man. And when Nehemiah faced opposition from his enemies, he didn't give up his trust in God. Right. I thought that was so huge. They came and they're like, what are you trying to do? Rebuild this in a day? And you don't have, man, and they start just trying to get him distracted, trying to get his mind focused right. on how big of a task this was going to be instead of just taking charge and going. And they started to speak negatively and, and they started to try to get him off track, man. There's always going to be a sand ballot to try to creep into your life to get you off track from being a mom, a dad, a husband, a wife, a minister, a Christian. There's always going to be something to try to distract you. Always. Always, right. always, man. Every time I've ever seen a great move of God, usually beforehand, I was so distracted and fighting so many battles that I happened to pray so much because I felt so distant, man, and I felt so messed up. And you go, and all I have at that point is God, dependent totally upon right. Him. Amen. And all the times when He blows your mind and He moves, and you're like, yeah. man, God, but you're going to have opposition. You may decide to rebuild something. Hear me, man. I want you to really take this in, and this is the last thing I'm going to say. You may decide to rebuild something in your life. You may decide to. It might be a relationship. It, it might be a relationship with God. You might be trying to rebuild that. It might be with family. It might be with friends. But you got to remember, man, that the enemy tries to stop the rebuilding process by various means. Right. He just doesn't come with one obvious thing. He doesn't come with the same old struggle. He doesn't come with the same old, man, he's crafty. He knows you. He knows your weaknesses, man. He knows when you feel lonely and isolated. And those are the times that he waits for to just mess with you. And there's going to be sand bouts. There's going to be distractions. There's going to be that, man. And we got to remember that this is a battle. We're not fighting. We're not rebuilding without anyone coming against the rebuilding. Mm -hmm. We're rebuilding with our hand on our sword, knowing that if I let go of my sword, I can get caught off guard. There is a battle coming. There is opposition coming. They are going to try to stop this. We gotta remain focused on God and not give up. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I'll close with that, man. I want y'all to remain focused on God and not give up. Yeah. Man, I, I, I get heartbroken when I see people.